Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyam, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next installment of Here to Help. Today is December 6th. We're on day 643 of Global Work from Home. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. This is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps us up at night. And what powers that mission is our people. And Here to Help is a look at how people's experiences and stories inspire them to want to help others. Now, today on Here to Help, we have a very special guest. Emily Ramshaw is an American journalist and news executive. She is co-founder and CEO of The 19th, an independent nonprofit newsroom reporting at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy in the U.S. The 19th's mission is to elevate the voices of women, people of color, and the LGBTQ plus community and to arm them with the information, resources, and community they need to be equal participants in American democracy. The 19th gives all of its journalism away for free to readers and to every other news organization in America. And among her many accolades, Emily was named to Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list in 2020, and she serves as a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board. Emily, thank you so much for joining me today. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, let's start where we always start these conversations by asking, how are you doing today? You know, I'm awesome. Uh, I got to have a relatively like normal uh, head into the holidays weekend where we, we are a multi, uh, multi uh, holiday household in our, our home here. And so we finished up Hanukkah last night. And as you can see, we finally got the Christmas tree up in the background. So it felt like maybe we were heading into sort of a more normal holiday season this year. So I'm doing great. How about you? How are you? Uh, I am doing very well. We actually laid low this weekend. My wife and I both got our boosters on Friday, and so we we yeah, took it work. easy. But uh, we're feeling great today. So thanks for asking. Um, well, so as I mentioned at the outset, you're the co-founder and CEO of the 19th. For those who are listening in who don't know, can you explain what the 19th is all about? Yeah, sure. So the vision for the 19th really is to elevate the voices of people who have been marginalized in American media for far too long. So, you know, if you look at the media landscape, you know, 80% of politics and policy editors are male, almost all of them are white men, um, you know, that tracks for politics and policy reporters as well. And so the vision for us as the 19th was could we bring a more inclusive lens to the storytelling? Could we bring a more inclusive audience to the table? Could we really try to sort of rewrite the national narrative so that it centered women, so that it centered um, you know, the LGBTQ community, so it centers people who aren't used to seeing themselves on the front page or leading the home page? So that's really sort of the vision behind the 19th. We've only been doing this for about a year and a half. So we are a pandemic baby for sure. And I'm excited to talk about that a little bit more, but it's been a pretty wild ride. Great. So yeah, we're going to dive into a bunch of different areas of this. One thing that that I'd love to talk about is really just the inspiration to to launch right now. And, and a, a good friend of mine um, likes to say when before speaking, she likes to ask herself the, these three questions. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said by me now? So what was the particular moment that made you feel that after a, a long and very successful career in uh, maybe not legacy, but a little more traditional media, um, why launch a, a nonprofit national newsroom focused specifically on women and marginalized voices? Yeah, sure. I mean, the honest answer is it started in 2016. Um, I had been in a more sort of traditional media space. I was the editor in chief of the Texas Tribune, but I was on maternity leave uh, with a baby girl um, when Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump. And, you know, I was absorbing all the headlines around, you know, is Hillary Clinton electable? Is she likable? Um, all of these headlines to me that seemed so fundamentally rooted in sexism. You know, we weren't asking questions about likability or it didn't seem to matter whether Donald Trump was likable or not. And so that that trope was frustrating to me. And it was really hard, obviously, to be on maternity leave at a time when uh, it felt like there'd sort of been a referendum on women in this country, right? Uh, as a woman to wake up on election day, uh, the morning after election day in 2016, and think like, what just happened here? Um, 
was, was a pretty big moment for me. And I thought in that moment, you know, what if we had had a national newsroom of record that centered women's experiences? You know, what if what if we weren't asking questions about electability or likability? We were asking questions about leadership uh, or assuming that women were electable, because if you elect women, they're electable. <laughs> and so I had this vision in that moment. But then the reality was I was trying to keep a small human alive in conjunction with my husband. Uh, and it wasn't the right moment for me to think about doing something else. And so I just sort of pushed that idea out of my head, thinking someone else will do this. It's such an obvious idea. And then four years later, we had you know more women on the 2020 stage than ever before. If you remember looking at those debate stages, uh, we had more women of color and queer people on the 2020 stage than we'd ever had before. And yet the conversations were still around electability and likability. They were also around, um, does she want it too much? Is she too ambitious? Uh, you know, the sort of Stacey Abrams uh, effect. Those were, were headlines to me that seemed not just a sexist, but also racist. And in that moment, I thought, nobody has done this in the last four years. Um, you know, I'm not sure I'm the right person to do this, but somebody needs to do it. And that was the moment when I think I first sort of, you know, conceived of the 19th in partnership with a couple of my really close colleagues um, and decided, you know, if, fear or not, we had to, to make the leap toward trying to rewrite this national narrative. So launching any new venture is a, a terrifying leap into the unknown uh, a venture like this which is which is fundamentally different in so many ways also in a time when people are questioning what the viability of uh, media might be and then um, just to lay out the timeline for those folks that don't know you mm -hmm. you you left your, you announced your leaving job in, in December you officially founded the 19th in in January of 2020 you launched in August so between making the sleep, and even launching, then the world was hit by a global pandemic. Can you can you talk through how you navigated that experience? Yes, it was hell. Uh, I mean, I think the the long and short is look like I'm actually a relatively risk averse person. As you just heard, it took me basically four years to get up the nerve to even consider doing this. And I I think some of that comes down to gender, honestly. Like there were questions for me about, you know, did I have vision? Um, was I was I a visionary? Was I a CEO? Could I raise money? You know, I was really great at being the number two, and I thought maybe that was the safe place for me to stay. But as I told you a couple of minutes ago. It just felt so intense and it felt like such a moment. And I felt like I owed it to my daughter and I owed it to my mother and I owed it to all the women who didn't look like me or my mother or my daughter who had even, you know, uh, who were, were hit even harder by these factors. And so, so yes, so it was already scary. It was already scary to leave my job. It was already scary to say we needed to raise $2 million and then $5 million and then $10 million. And then the pandemic hit um, and it was there were uh, I think my uh, husband can uh, attest to many uh, sleepless nights and me sitting at our dining room table, basically in my pajamas in tears, wondering, you know, our fundraising, we had been raising something like seven hundred thousand dollars a month in those early couple of months. And then the fundraising dried up to, I think, thirty seven thousand dollars a month on average between basically March and May of twenty twenty. Uh, I thought we weren't going to be able to launch at all. Uh, I thought maybe we were going to have to push this whole venture back by a year. Um, we had these big plans and then we all sort of looked at each other and locked arms and said, you know, uh, women and uh, women of color and the queer community are going to be those who are hardest hit by this pandemic. It was obvious from the, the early days. Um, you know, we have an obligation even more than before to do what we said we were going to do. And so we started with, you know, first a, a, a newsletter that came out every other week, and then it was every week, and then suddenly it was every day. And then, you know, we were publishing with the Washington Post. They were gracious to, to accept our journalism in the months leading up to our official launch. And so we did that for several months. Well, one of our reporters, Aaron Haynes, was the first reporter nationally to tell the story of Breonna Taylor, to tell it on a national stage. And to do it through the lens of, you know, um, the family's concerns that black men who were killed by police were getting more media attention than black women who were killed by police. And that story obviously put the 19th on the map during a, a really critical summer. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly it all just sort of snowballed. I mean, we had a big launch summit that we can talk about in a couple of minutes where we had extraordinary names and extraordinary turnout in many ways, the result of a pandemic and doing everything virtually kind of like this. 
And suddenly it was a thing and people were reading and it was just this sort of train, you know, rushing down the tracks. And so it has been an exceedingly difficult year for so many reasons. You know, two years in at this point, we still have not met our full staff in person, uh, which is a really, really unusual way to run a startup, to run a company. But, but it felt like a moment where we had no choice but to take the risk. So um, I, there, there's so much to, to talk through in all of this. I, I want to actually go back to, to, to the very start a little bit in just the, the name uh, of the, the organization, the 19th. And also when it's in print, it's stylized with an asterisk. So can you explain what the, where the name comes from and what that stylized asterisk represents? Yep. So we knew from the beginning, we thought we wanted to be called the 19th in honor of the 19th Amendment, which, uh, you know, officially gave uh, everyone the right to vote regardless of gender. Um, and the 19th Amendment, you know, the 100th anniversary was actually at the same time as our launch. So August of 2020. So for obvious reasons, it felt both symbolic, it felt meaningful, it felt time appropriate, it felt like there would be a sort of um, fever pitch of activity around it. But when we really started talking as a group about the name the 19th, look, the reality is that the 19th Amendment extended the vote to white women. And at the end of the day, white women in many ways achieved the right to vote on the backs of black women who were working equally hard for suffrage. Um, you know, it, there was a there was a lot of racism, a lot of misogyny in and around all of these conversations. And the 19th Amendment didn't go far enough. You know, it took another four decades well into the civil rights movement uh, for, for women of color, for black women to uh, get access to the franchise. And so for us as an organization, we really believed the 19th was unfinished business. And when we started batting around what that meant, um, one of our colleagues, Aaron Haynes, who's now an MSNBC contributor said, yeah, it's like the 19th Amendment, but with an asterisk. And suddenly like this light bulb went up off for us that the asterisk was our logo. It was our mission. It's it's um, it's the connective tissue. And, and the asterisk is really actually what we think about every time we're trying to, to decide what makes a 19th story. For us, it's what's the asterisk on this story? What's the gender or racial? What's the intersectional lens? And, you know, visually, when you think about intersections, that's what an asterisk is. And so for us, um, you know, the 19th is still unfinished business, the 19th Amendment. When you look at the access to the franchise around the country and what uh, you know hurdles states have put into place for people trying to cast their ballots, for you know formerly incarcerated people, uh, for transgender Americans who are uh, facing you know barriers with their IDs at the polls, um, the asterisk makes the Nineteenth Amendment a living, breathing. Um, sort of emblem and motto for us, uh, what the 19th Amendment was meant to do and what we know it can do. So that's a good question. I like talking about the asterisk. <laughs> Thanks. So, and you know, when we were meeting last week to talk through this, you you, you talked a little bit about, and I'd love to, to hear you share just your experience as, as a white woman and recognizing your own privilege through this experience and how that has shaped where you have gone, both editorially and, and with the organization. Yeah, sure. I mean, so look, like all of us, I'm a product of my upbringing. I'm a product of my of my privilege and of the color of my skin. And I think, you know, when we started the 19th, I, to be candid, I was thinking about women, politics and policy. I was thinking about those women who were on the stage. I wasn't thinking probably with remotely the kind of, of um, intersectional or even gender diverse lens that we think about the 19th uh, now. But, but pretty quickly it became clear both over the course of the pandemic and as we continued to think about our own identity that um, certainly women of color were, were hardest hit, certainly people who were marginalized based on their gender, so queer people, uh, you know, anytime that the power of the patriarchy is in play, it's not just women who are affected. And so for us as an organization, at about um, the sort of one year mark, we officially expanded our brand and our audience, our mission to say we're serving not just women, but specifically women of color and the queer community. Um, and that was an important shift for us as an organization, for us reputationally, for us, for our audience. But to be perfectly candid, it was a, an important shift um, for me personally. Uh, I've been on a journey this last year. I think a lot of us who are in roles like ours um, have been. And I'm not going to lie, like there are days when I wonder, am I the right person to be to be leading this kind of kind of mission and this kind of change? Um, and at the end of the day, where I land on this, I'm not sure it's the right place, but, you know, speaking from a place of vulnerability, like where I've landed on this is if I am able to raise the kind of money for this nonprofit organization that changes the game for the next generation of women and queer people in news, I will have served my purpose. 
I don't need to be the one out front. I don't need to be the one on TV. You know, I don't need to be the one producing the journalism. But my role in this moment in history, I think, is is to make the business model work, to make journalism, uh, particularly journalism that serves women and queer people, sustainable, financially um, uh, viable. And, and if I can do that and commit myself and my career to lifting folks up who haven't uh, had their uh, who haven't had their moment um, at the center of this industry, that's what I'm going to do. I might I might feel differently on this next week. I'm on a journey, as I know we all, all are. But um, but it's been an interesting, really interesting time to grapple with those kinds of issues. Thank you for for sharing that. So one of the areas clearly where this shows up and and from the founding of the 19th was you wanted to build a different kind of newsroom. You wanted to bring d- the diversity uh, of perspective and experience into the newsroom. That That is what you were describing you weren't seeing in other newsrooms around the world. And that that clearly was there not just to create opportunity, which is an important piece, but actually because it's really going to shape the product itself. And that's you know something that we talk about a lot at Indeed, that diversity for diversity's sake. There's a whole bunch of research that shows that it is just a good thing. But we know that the business that we're in of helping people get jobs where marginalized people find themselves marginalized, employment is one of the, the foundational pieces. And so by changing the shape of our organization, we're actually looking at different problems and different solutions to those problems. So how, how, do, how did you set out to build uh, a different kind of newsroom and and really influence the the perspective that you're bringing to these stories. Yeah, sure. I mean, you and I have talked a little bit about this concept of objectivity, right? Like this, there was this idea in this industry that, you know, well, uh, the news needs to remain completely ob- objective. And, and the reality is the question is like objective for who? Because when you look at the industry, again, over the course of time, over the course of history, the people who have been making decisions on what is news and what isn't news have largely been white men, right? They're the ones saying, uh, this is where the story plays on the front page or the home page. They're the ones deciding who's quoted in those stories, whose voices are elevated, whose anecdotes lead those stories. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, uh, that's not objective either. <laughs> objective for who? Whom? And and so as we think about when we thought about launching the 19th, for us, there's this idea of like who who owns their own story, who gets to tell their stories. And I feel very strongly, our team feels very strongly that when your newsroom represents the community, when it accurately reflects the community, the stories that are elevated are the stories that need to be told, the stories, the news becomes more representative. But how do you make the news more representative? That was the question that we were grappling with. And for us, one of the big answers to that is, I mean, first of all, intentionality, right? I mean, we have a newsroom that is more than 70% people of color, you know, uh, more than uh, 15% uh, queer uh, colleagues on our team. Like we we went into this with intention, of course, but, but beyond that, how do you keep them? How do you retain them? How do you ensure that your newsroom continues to be what you set out to be? And for us, that has really come down to both culture and also benefits. Um, you know, we know, uh, historically speaking, that um, when uh, women and other marginalized folks have the support systems they need, they stay in the industry longer. Uh, they advance to the highest levels of their field. So for us, that means things like six months of fully paid family leave for new parents. It means four months of caregiving leave if you need to take care of an elderly relative or a a sick child, you know, the sandwich generation uh, 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 trope is real uh, and it uh, hits women uh, hardest of all, candidly. Uh, we have a fully remote workforce where we say work wherever you have the support systems you need, wherever you have the child care and elder care setup you need. We cover 100% of our employees' health care premiums. Um, you know, for us, the vision is if we can provide uh, the kind of security and comfort to allow you to navigate those hardest years of your career, which in many year, uh, ways coincide with the hardest years of your child rearing or your elderly parents, um, that, that we will be rewarded by keeping those folks in the business far longer. And then when they're, you know, in their 50s, when they're in their 60s, when they're at the peak of their career, they get to be, you know, running these organizations uh, because they were able to withstand that period in time. So for us, it's a combination, right? It's culture. It's how do we fight burnout? It's how do we um, tell people that <laughs> that their job isn't the most important thing and that we know they'll be more valuable to their jobs if they uh, their mental health is great and they are supported at home. Um, I want to get away from thinking of news the way we have traditionally, which is, you know, your butt in the editing chair basically for 12 hours a day or this breathless, competitive, you know, and needlessly competitive field. Um, 
uh, we can do better. And if we do better, we're going to keep women, uh, women of color and the LGBTQ community in this business far longer. So one of the things that that shows up when when conversations um, like this happen around being able to offer incredibly generous and robust benefits is, you know, number one, that's OK. You can do that if you're a company like Indeed with thousands of employees all over the world. But this is a startup with you know maybe dozens of employees and you're doing it in the middle of a pandemic under tight financial pressure. So how um, how was it to be able to announce things like a, a six month leave policy when the company was not even six months old and and to be able to and to be able to to, to stick to that? Obviously, you, you think it's important, but what would you say, I guess, to other people who are in a similar situation and, and, and how has that been? I mean, the truth is we budgeted for it from day one. Uh, it was a non-negotiable for us. And I think it was a value proposition also when we went to funders. So we're a nonprofit. We're a 501c3. You know, um, I would call us an entrepreneurial nonprofit. I, you know, we, we go after corporate dollars the same way we go after foundation and philanthropic dollars. It's important to me to have a really diversified set of revenue streams everywhere from, you know, membership all the way through corporate underwriting. Uh, but when we went to major funders and the early philanthropists who invested in the 19th, we said to them from go, these are the things we're providing. And this is the reason we're going to be a nonprofit and not a for-profit. We had some folks say to us, you know, this business model is so good, you should be a for-profit. This idea is so good, you should be a for-profit. Uh, and when at the end of the day, when we looked at um, the numbers, we said, you know, there were three things that were not negotiable for us. The journalism wanted to be free. We didn't want any barrier to people accessing our work. We wanted to give our journalism not just to readers, but to every other newsroom in the country, because we know, given the business model, you know, newspapers are struggling across the country and we didn't want where you lived to determine whether you got access to the 19th journalism. And then the third was the benefits. You know, candidly, I don't think in a for profit, a fledgling startup for profit, we would have been able to offer those kinds of benefits. But as a nonprofit, we could build it into our business model. And as I said, it was a value proposition both for the people who support us, but by the way, also for the incredible journalists we were able to lure away from other organizations to come uh, to the 19th because they'd never worked anywhere with this kind of culture or these kinds of benefits. I'd love to come back for a second to, you had referenced your uh, launch period of, uh, of the 19th, and there were a couple of big opportunities early on, which when we were talking earlier today, you said actually both happened on the same day. So. Um, so you, you had a chance to sit down with with Meghan Markle uh, back in August of last year, which was obviously a, a huge deal. Um, and uh, on the same day, you had a chance to have the, the first actually sit down that anyone has had um, with Kamala Harris, uh, now vice president, right after the announcement of her addition to the ticket. So can you talk about what what went into actually getting getting both of those and and what was that day like for you wild yeah as i you know as i said we'd had sort of this launching in fits and starts we'd been trying to sort of get across the finish line for this big august 2020 launch and we had planned to have a launch summit and we were hoping it would be in person we were expecting you know 500 people in a hotel ballroom obviously covid made that impossible and so we decided we would take the whole summit virtual and that when we did we would just ask everyone you know we and just see what stuck so the first person to say yes actually who i owe it all to was meryl streep who agreed to, to read some really amazing suffrage speeches. I don't know, like it was playing six degrees of Kevin Bacon, right, to get an email in front of her team. So she said yes. And when she said yes, suddenly Hillary Clinton said yes. And Stacey Abrams said yes. And the New York Symphony Orchestra agreed to perform via Zoom. And then the Go-Go's agreed to get back together and perform. It was like one thing after the other. It was like this was getting cooler and cooler. And then we had this big ask in front of Kamala Harris, uh, you know, coincidentally, uh, she had, she was sort of, she had said yes to us. And then coincidentally, uh, she was named Biden's VP nominee, the first uh, uh, woman on that, you know, a ticket of that uh, caliber, like literally it was the same week as our launch summit. And she agreed to give the 19th, her first sit down interview. We also had her first sit down actually as VP. Uh, but I think for her in that moment, it was, you know, she'd heard the buzz about the 19th and uh, uh, an organization at the intersection of gender and, and racial justice felt like the place for her. So that was a huge get 
But probably the wildest thing in all of this is that we got a, a random phone call from uh, Meghan Markle's team basically saying, you know, uh, that she's coming back to the United States. And we were like, yeah, duh, of course, you know, everybody knows she's coming back to the United States and that she'd heard about the 19th and that she cared about high quality media uh, and gender and, and, and racial equity. And she wanted to participate in our launch summit. And we almost fell on the floor. And of course, I said, you know, I would love to interview her, you know, this the my I have like my eyeballs are getting so huge, like the first, you know, sit down, tell all with Meghan Markle. And they said, no, no, no. She wants to interview you about the 19th. Um, and we said quickly, well, that works, too. And so suddenly, you know, we didn't have 500 people in a room in a hotel ballroom. We had, you know, over 200,000 people engaged with us in this week long summit in real time. Um, you know, we hoped we'd have a thousand paying members of the 19th in our first year, people who gave us $19 uh, out of the goodness of their hearts. And instead we had, you know, 11,000 and everything just took off from there. It was about the um, wildest ride of a launch you could possibly imagine, particularly given where we all were in August of 2020, which was pretty dark days between the pandemic, between, you know, George Floyd. Like, I mean, these were, these were difficult times, um, but in many ways, the 19th, I think created community and space for dialogue. Um, honestly, like there was never a, a better time for us to launch. Um, so as hard as it was, I, 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 you know, I was not one of these believers in like, you know, good things come to those who power through, but, but it really was an example of that. That That's an extraordinary story. And, and it is um, always, there's a, there's a linchpin somewhere that, you know, that sounds like the Merrill Streep was the the sort of cornerstone in, in, in pulling she that together. She has no but... idea how much, how grateful <laughs> I am for her. <laughs> Well, so I guess one one question, and there's and there's so many uh, questions that come from that. But one is when when you have something out of the gate as explosive as that, what do you do next Monday? You know, how how do you how do you build on that? Because you're not going to have the same kind of attention, and you're going you know into just building an an audience and and uh, um, and and really a perspective kind of day to day from there. Um, how how do you sort of ride that wave and, and turn that into something sustainable and daily? Uh, for us, it was with extraordinary journalism, right? That had to be the next piece. Um, you know, we had a young and sort of fledgling team that we staffed up pretty quick after that and were able to staff up pretty quickly after that big splash. And I think, you know, within uh, the early weeks, we were producing extraordinary journalism. Some of the, you know, earliest and biggest reporting on the sort of she session, the first, you know, women specific recession, um, uh, some really explosive reporting around the Lincoln Project um, and a, a toxic environment uh, for, for women in the workplace at the Lincoln Project, um, you know, investigative work, uh, daily drumbeat. And then, you know, the last year, uh, if you were a trans person, if you were a trans girl in, in schools, it's been a, a supremely dramatic and, and difficult time. Uh, if uh, you are uh, on the ground in Texas or Mississippi, uh, where there are uh, lots of conversations around restrictions around uh, women's health, uh, restrictions around reproductive justice, restrictions around abortion, you know, that's been a huge story for us. The 19th is actually based in Texas, which a lot of people said to us from day one, you know, why aren't you starting the 19th in New York or in D.C. or on you know, the West Coast? And to be candid, this was where we were supposed to be as well um, in this moment. And so I think it's the drumbeat of great journalism that keeps the conversation going. We have certainly replicated those events. The big we have a big summit every year. Uh, the names have, you know, gotten bigger and better. Uh, you know, if that's possible, uh, it has continued to grow. And we have virtual events, you know, on a monthly basis around everything from, you know, gender in the military um, and, you know, changes therein to um, the role of, you know, black women in this um, political environment. And so we've kept the conversation alive with a pretty steady drumbeat. We've also had some pretty great news. Uh, honestly, just a couple of weeks ago, we announced a $4 million investment in the, a national uh, journalism fellowship program that is really going to be world class and is going to serve um, graduates of historically black colleges and universities. Um, the 19th is, is trying to change the game in a whole wide range of fronts. Um, and, and those big developments have also kept us in the headlines and our brand front and center. So I'd imagine that the change in the game probably has more than one piece. I mean, one part of it is that you obviously want to grow your your uh, audience and your readership and and bring on more amazing journalists and tell bigger and um, and more 
in-depth stories, but I'd imagine you also are hoping to influence the industry at large. So I guess, you know, the, the first question is what, what has the reaction been from other media um, for you, you know, doing something, at least in terms of the business model, it being a nonprofit, which is very different than what you know, everyone is focused on. How do I monetize? And there's a whole um, host of problems that some people see in the, the monetization of, of news. Um, and, and then in particular on, on this focus of, of what um, has been very clearly uh, a marginalized set of voices that just by the math you laid out are, are not in any way a, a, a minority. So what, what, what kind of response did you hear early on and, and have you seen in, in the broader media industry? You know, I was nervous at first because what you, I was worried of going out into the sort of field and people saying, you know, well, we've done this already. Or, you know, are you saying we're not doing a good enough job? Are you saying we're not serving these people well enough when, you know, the whole sort of message behind the 19th was, yeah, that is, that is what we're saying, honestly, that we have not done a good enough job centering the voices of the marginalized. We've not done a good enough job centering, telling women's stories. Um, and so that was, I was nervous about that honestly, uh, and nervous about the reception we might get. Um, but the reality was, you know, it's funny, the first place I spoke before the whole world shut down in February of 2020, we had just announced the 19th, and the New York Times had a women's group, a women's lunch group, and they invited me to come speak. And I was really scared because that was a place I thought, like, here I am at the New York Times, you know, they're going to be like, who is this girl, this, you know, rinky dink, like trying to start this thing uh, uh, for women and gender minorities based in Texas of all places. And the room was wrapped. And one after another, these women were coming up to me and saying, like, this needs to exist. Uh, I'll support you. I'll support you financially. I'll evangelize on behalf of the 19th. You know, the industry is broken and we need this. And across the board, that has been the reaction, which surprised me, um, but has also been super affirming. You know, we... I also think we're seeing a 19th effect. There are organizations that have uh, mirrored our benefit policies since then with the argument that if the scrappy 19th can, this, you know, year and a half old startup can do this, why can't we do this in our legacy institutions? And so I feel um, like we have really made an impact in a really short amount of time. I mean, there's still a ton of work to do, but to see that kind of reaction out and, and especially with our launch, I mean, we had a lot of people saying to us, you know, my God, basically, like, how did this, how did this happen? This, again, this scrappy team of people in a pandemic. And I have had these moments, I think, that a lot of us have had in the pandemic, which is like, if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody notice? Like, if you launch a startup news organization in a pandemic, like, you do it literally all from your living room, like, does anyone notice? Um and, and in my dark moments at the like three o'clock and four o'clock in the morning when I wake up in a cold sweat, it's like, did we do this? Did this really happen? <laughs> uh, we're still pinching ourselves. Um, but yes, I mean, I think a lot of work left to do, but it's been surreal, I think, for all of us. So can you talk a little bit about, so part of this foundation is that your your news um, will always be free, both to people who want to consume it themselves, but also to other outlets. What is that experience like and, and what, where do you hope that goes in terms of, you know, will every will every media outlet have their 19th column or or how, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's been interesting. Our first relationship was with Gatehouse, which is the sort of USA Today network of newspapers. On our first day in business, we had a big story on the She Session on the front page centerpiece in USA Today. And, you know, that network is 260 newspapers. And consistently, we see our journalism cropping up in those news organizations. Um, Univision began translating our work into Spanish and distributing it, which was a really early and fantastic partnership that truly was mission aligned. And then suddenly it started appearing on the national stage. You know, the PBS NewsHour uh, started running the 19th journalism. Uh, you know, we our headlines have ended up everywhere from basically um, Elle magazine to Town and Country to, um, you know, Mississippi Today, which is a, a nonprofit newsroom. And I think it's been really incredible to see organically uh, how news organizations, you know, all you have to do is click the republish button on one of our stories and you grab that code and those stories get republished. I think, um, you know, going forward, intentionality um, is going to have to be a really uh, sort of more critical piece of this. It's not enough for it just to be organic. We need to make sure we are targeting the communities where we want our stories to take off. And so 
that looks like you know, more intentional actual news and reporting partnerships with local newsrooms. It looks like working with ethnic media, um, you know, uh, with, with news organizations that are serving specific communities of color to get our work republished, to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Um, and it looks like using technology to make our journalism, you know, more easily ported into newsrooms truly across the country. So that's the next sort of the next big push for us is scale. Is there any sort of swimming upstream with the desire for many media outlets uh, outlets to have a scoop or to have exclusives where if you're trying to create something in free and you want to push it out as far and wide where there are certain people who are not interested unless they can have it sort of as their own or is this is that something that you think will change over time I think it's been changing. I think the industry is getting smarter. I mean, you still see in sort of DC media, this competitive, it, nothing makes me crazier than like watching, you know, a press conference where you've got, you know, 50 reporters in the same room where like 47 of those reporters could be out actually like breaking news or investigating something. And instead everybody's hustling for that same tidbit. And so, you know, I don't, I, I don't subscribe to that a kind of journalism. I, I think it's, um, I think it's wasteful. <laughs> and I think there's a lot more we could be doing as an industry if we were collaborating more, if we were sharing more. And, but I do think the industry has changed a lot. And I think the advent of nonprofit news, um, the sort of more ex the sort of explosion of nonprofit news over the last 10 to 15 years in particular, has really uh, moved that ball. I mean, you've looked, you know, ProPublica, which is, you know, one of the absolute best in the business, has been partnering with news organizations big and small since day one. The Texas Tribune, where I spent 11 years before starting the 19th, you know, we gave all of our journalism away for free to every newspaper in Texas. And it was phenomenal. You know, some days there would be 12 Texas newspapers that had Texas Tribune stories on the front page. And so I think uh, the more we get comfortable with collaboration, with sharing our journalism you know, look, there aren't enough newsroom resources to go around right now. And the more that we can spread, uh, spread the love around, I think the better off we're all going to be, you know, as, as public citizens. Coming back to sort of the, the start and um, the goal of, of creating um, equity in the creation and distribution of, of news, can, can you just share a little bit about where you are today and what you've been able to achieve, which is extraordinary, given given the the, the time and the and the resources and 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 how difficult it is. But where you where you would like to see this in in the future? What does real equity look like in in news? I honestly think real equity in news starts with real equity inside newsrooms, uh, and that's uh, another journey that I think I've been on this past year. I mean, I you know. I, like I said, I was raised in newsroom environments where if you had $100,000, you stretched that $100,000 as far as you possibly could, uh, even if it meant paying people salaries that were less than what they were worth, you know, and I think... Um, it's been really interesting to be in an environment where, led by our incredible chief people officer, we did our first pay equity audit this year. Uh, we really started thinking critically about, um, you know, what the floor should be for our staff salaries and how we could make that floor higher than anybody else's floor. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, the last year has been a lesson in equity in racial equity and gender equity out in the world, for sure. And our journalism has brought that to light day in and day out, whether it's disparities in who gets access to vaccines and when to, you know, who has the luxury of complaining about working from home versus, you know, having kids at home while you're working as a janitor, uh, you know, in a building, in, in a hospital. Like equity is central to, to our are functioning as a nation right now. And it's a huge part of the national conversation. I think for us, it's been really critical to insist that we're looking inside our organization and instituting uh, greater safeguards for equity there as well. So starts at home. I think it has to start at home so you can extend that work um, further afield. Before we wrap up, just one uh, sort of final, uh, I guess, detour on the topic. I, you know, In your bio, and I mentioned this at the start, you are uh, a member of the Pulitzer Prize board. Um, that is is clearly you know one of the most revered and, and hallowed um, uh, organizations and and so few people I think understand anything about that. Can you talk? I guess I'd just love to hear a little bit about what was it, what was it like to even find out that that was um, you know something that you you were in consideration for and, and getting that offer and and what is that? How is that looking at um, other people and their achievements? How has that shaped you uh, as a journalist? 
Well, first of all, it's like being part of the coolest book club ever. So it's an enormous amount of reading. My husband can attest. I basically read between Thanksgiving and May nonstop. Uh, but it is, it's an extraordinary honor. And I think it, it's in some ways, first of all, you, know, you don't know you've been nominated. You don't know you're under consideration and you get a phone call. I was standing in the parking lot of a place called Cherrywood Coffee in Austin, uh, uh, you know, trying to like get my uh, kid into her car seat and my phone starts ringing with a number I didn't recognize. And I don't know why I picked it up. Like it was a, a circumstance where I wouldn't pick it up. And it said, you've been elected to the board of the Pulitzer Prize. And I was like, what? I'm not running. What do you, this must be a mistake. And they said, no, you were nominated and you were elected. And, you know, it's now your choice whether you serve or not. And it's nine years. So it's a pretty um, intense uh, board service. But it's, um, it has been a gift. Um, the, the board members read the three finalists or consume the three finalists in every single category. So everything from, you know, history and biography books to all of the many journalism categories, and there are a lot of them, to music, to poetry, to theater. And, and so we uh, then deliberate on the sort of, and choose the winners from the final three in each of those many categories. And there are, I think, 18, around 18 members of the board at any given time. And I think, um, talk about like imposter syndrome. The first time I showed up in that room with these legendary journalists and, and novel Pulitzer Prize winning novelists and historians and at the Harvard ethicists. And it was like, what the hell am I doing here? I was afraid to open my mouth, I think for the first like two full board meetings, because I was afraid I was about to get exposed. Um, and the truth is, you know, we're all swimming in the same sea here. Like it's, it was, it's been magical. Uh, there are a lot of things about it I can't talk about, which is super fun to have this sort of secret deep throat stuff, but, um, but it's a gift. And, and also it requires me to consume extraordinary works of literature and journalism that I might not have otherwise consumed to, to have nine years where you are forced to read the absolute best books in the world is, is, uh, I shouldn't say forced. It's like, it's such a gift. Well, thank you for sharing that. As we wrap up here and I could keep talking for a whole, uh, a lot of time here. This is a really amazing conversation, but I, I like to, um, ask the same question of everyone at the end, which is just sort of looking back over the past 21 months throughout this pandemic um, with all of the the challenges and, and difficulties that, that the world has faced and that we've faced as individuals, what in that experience has left you optimistic for the future? I think the big thing that has left me optimistic is in many ways the leveling of the playing field inside workplaces. Um, you know, I think that might sound counterintuitive, but when we're all engaging in a Zoom screen, when we're all engaging on Slack, when people are able to have um, the luxuries of, of being at home, I mean, this sounds so silly, but like for me, the gift of being able to um, put a chicken in the oven to start roasting like an hour before my kid gets home from school, so we're not all frantic, to be able to fold a load of laundry while I'm on a meeting. Don't worry, I have not been doing it uh, on this call. Uh, I mean, all of those things sound so silly, um, but but it's been a, a sort of recentering for me of my life around my family, um, which is really special. Well, Emily, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today, but thank you really so much for what you're doing. Um, it really does feel so vital and essential, and it's, and it's clear that it's having a real impact in the world. And I, I really look forward to sitting down and talking to you five years from now uh, to just say, wow, how amazing was all of that. Um, and But thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Happy to be here. 